The subject assigned to me is what is the Reformed faith? What is the Reformed faith? Obviously, in a single address it is not possible uh, to explore all the ramifications of the, what we call the Reformed faith. But tonight I want us to consider what is most central, most fundamental to what we call the Reformed faith. Let me say, first of all, the Reformed faith is biblical Christianity as rediscovered and defined by the Protestant reformers and their Puritan successors. The Reformed faith is biblical Christianity as rediscovered and defined by the Protestant reformers and their Puritan successors. When we speak of the Reformed faith, we are not speaking of something over and above biblical Christianity. It is not an addition or a supplement to the teaching of the Word of God. It is simply a very accurate setting forth of the doctrine contained in Holy Scripture. And it dates from the period of the Protestant Reformation and is set forth in such confessions of faith as the Westminster Confession. So it's called the Reformed Faith because uh, the sharp definition of biblical truth that we have in mind uh, derives from the Protestant Reformation. But it is, in fact, biblical Christianity. So we are not to regard the Reformed faith as an optional ex extra for the more refined theological palate, as a sort of a, a doctrinal delicatessen uh, for those of special tastes. No, the Reformed faith is biblical Christianity. And every Christian, accepting the word of God, should recognize and is duty-bound to recognize the Reformed doctrines as biblical doctrines which he personally wholeheartedly embraces and approves. So it is not an extra nicety uh, but a historical expression of true biblical Christianity. Now this is important because fundamental to the Reformed faith is that the Holy Scriptures alone are the rule of faith and practice. Uh, sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. The, the Scriptures tell us what we are to believe uh, concerning God and what duty God requires of man. The exclusive and final authority of the Holy Scriptures is uh, fundamental to the Reformed faith. So we must understand that the Reformed faith is simple, simply biblical Christianity as very accurately defined by the Protestant reformers and uh, the Puritans. Secondly, the Reformed faith begins with a biblical view of God in his greatness. Uh, it begins, of course, with the Scriptures as the, uh, as the final authority, but deriving, coming from that, the Reformed faith begins with a biblical view of God in his greatness. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. The God of the Bible uh, differs utterly from the pagan ideas of deity. Uh, the pagans believe in gods, plural, but also they believe that the gods were simply like men and women, but with increased powers. They were super men and super women, but that's all. Now in Revelation 4, which we read, there is only one throne, and there is one who sits upon the throne. And uh, the attributes of this God are pictured for us. In verse 3, uh, we read that he looked uh, was to look upon like a jasper, uh, a jasper is like diamond, radiant in purity, uh, is indicating the holiness and the purity of God. And a sardine stone, brilliant red, indicating the judgment and justice of God. And uh, there was a rainbow uh, like 
in sight like unto an emerald. You remember that the rainbow uh, was a sign of God's covenant with Noah. But here this rainbow is green, perhaps signifying new life. The covenant of grace in Christ bringing life to the dead. His goodness and his mercy. And in verse 5 we read of lightnings and thunderings and voices indicating the awesome majesty and glory that belongs to this God. Now this view of God is fundamental to what we call the Reformed faith. He is Jehovah. He is sovereign and independent. He is in need of nothing and no one. He is absolutely independent of all his creatures. He performs his pleasure. He, uh, no one being his counselor has taught him. He is sovereign in all that he does and has need of nothing. And yet he sovereignly and graciously enters into covenant with men. That's why the name Jehovah is associated with the covenant of God because it was uh, brought to the fore, that name was brought to the fore in connection with God's covenant with men. So that the name Jehovah, which in itself uh, signifies God as I am, as independent of all, uh, nonetheless is associated with his sovereign grace towards men because it is this almighty, uh, sovereign and unchangeable God who shows his way to sinners. And uh, we must understand that there is an infinite distance between God and his creation. Uh, it is not true that God is all things and all things are God. God is infinitely exalted above all things. But then thirdly, the Reformed faith gives a right view of man's place before God. The Reformed faith gives a right view of man's place before God. When we have this biblical view of God, uh, and, you know, we can never think too highly of God. Uh, I hope we do understand that, that it is not possible to think too highly of God. When we have this biblical view of God, when we have some grasp of the greatness of God in his majesty and glory, his absolute holiness and purity, and his absolute sovereignty, then we will grasp man's true position before this God. And we will grasp that two things belong to God. That is power and authority. Power belongs unto the Lord. And all authority belongs to God. God controls all things and God has an absolute right to command his creatures. So absolute power and absolute authority belong to God. And this means that, therefore, man is absolutely dependent upon God in all things, and man is absolutely obliged to consciously submit to God in all things, and thirdly, that God disposes of his creatures as he pleases for his own glory. So three things. Man is always dependent on God. Man is always, ob always obliged to consciously and willingly and heartily submit to God. And God uh, disposes by right of his creatures as he pleases for his own glory. So then, this brings us our fourth point. God controls and commands and disposes of his own creatures for his own glory. That's our fourth point, fourth main point. God controls, commands, and disposes of his own creatures for his own glory. Let us look at these one at a time. First of all, God controls all things, and man is always dependent upon God. In Ephesians 1.11, we are told that God worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. In Psalm 33 uh, and verse 8 to 11, which we were singing earlier on, we read that, the, that 
the, de- the many are the devices in the hearts of the people. He makes their devices of none effect, but the counsel of the Lord. That shall stand. God is in control. The only foolproof plans are God's. And uh, in Psalm 135, and uh, verse 5, For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. As for man, he must say and should say, if the Lord will, we will live and do this or that. But God, he is in control. His plans are absolutely infallible in every detail of their execution. God is in control of creation, that the creation, he said, let there be light and there was light, and uh, let there be light in the firmament, and so on. He made the stars also. He spoke the word and it was done. God uh, preserves and governs all his creatures and all their actions. As Stephen Macaulay reminded us earlier on, he performs all his pleasure, and uh, uh, the idea of chance and of luck These are meaningless terms. The terms chance and luck as used today are used by those who wish to avoid acknowledging God as the first cause of all things. But the Lord Jesus Christ did not teach that there was such a thing as luck or chance or random events. He taught that all the details of history Uh, All the details of what takes place are ordained of God. Matthew 10, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. He says, a sparrow, two sparrows are worth a farthing, but one of them doesn't fall except by the will of the Father. And so God's government, God's control, extends to all his creatures and all their actions. It extends even to the sinful actions of his creatures, though God is not the author of the sinfulness of them. This is true even in the angelic world. We know that there were those angels who kept their first estate, And there were other angels that did not. Why was that so? Why was it that of the the angels, some of them uh, kept their first estate and remain holy uh, to this day, whereas Satan and uh, those who followed him rebelled? What determined uh, which angels would stay holy and which angels would rebel? The answer is indicated in 1 Timothy 5.21 where the apostle uh, charges Timothy but he uses a very interesting expression. He says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another. He says before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. He means the holy angels, but he calls them the elect angels, those angels chosen by God uh, to be preserved in holiness and to keep their first estate, because even a sinless creature is dependent on the power of God to stay sinless. Even a sinless creature is dependent on the power of God to remain sinless. Now, you might say, well, I don't understand that. Well, we don't understand that. But it is so that at no point is the creature independent of the Creator. And if a sinless being remains sinless, it is because his Creator has decreed that it shall be so. That means uh, that nothing Nothing takes place by chance, no, not even the fall of angels. In Job chapter 1 and verse 12, we get an indication uh, of the truth. 
uh, that even Satan's continuing activity is dependent upon divine permission. Uh, Job 1 and verse 12. Uh, you remember that Satan has uh, sought to uh, accuse God and accuse uh, God of the fact that the, the kingdom of grace is not real, that there's no such thing as a, a real saint of God on earth, uh, that there is no such thing as a sinner so renewed by the power of God that he has an unselfish love to God. He says, Job, he, he serves God, he worships God for his own end. But in verse 11, Satan says, But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in, the, in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So that Satan uh, could do nothing outside of the permission and plan of God. And uh, after his afflictions came upon him, Job rightly said, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. And uh, so, we understand that even the sinful actions of the fallen angels are ordained of God. And uh, what is true of fallen angels is certainly true of fallen men. Twice during this conference we have had reference to Genesis 50 and verse 20. Uh, you remember the way J uh, Joseph's brothers sold him as a slave into Egypt. And then in the adorable providence of God when they are reunited with Joseph after Jacob dies, his brother, Joseph's brothers are afraid that he will take revenge. But he says, Am I in the place of God? Ye meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God was in control. God was superintending all. And so that uh, the sin of Joseph's brothers were the means whereby Joseph was in a position to preserve those very brothers in the day of famine. Or in Second Samuel 16 and verse 10, when uh, David is fleeing from Jerusalem, before Absalom and Shimei from the hillside curses David and casts stones and dust at him and Abishai the son of Zeruiah uh, offers to go and take off his head and J uh, David says let him alone for the Lord has bidden him saying go curse David Shimei's action was evil but it was according to the decree and plan of God for David's correction and for his good. Psalm 76 verse 10 Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee and the remainder of wrath thou shalt restrain which we understand to mean that God will cause the wrath, the malice of men to so operate that it will redound to his glory according to his own glorious plan and the remainder of that wrath he will restrain so that God uh, 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 hems in and unleashes the malice of man so that his glorious purpose is fulfilled. And of course the most conspicuous example of all in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Speaking of the Lord Jesus, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So their hands were wicked, but it was still according to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Therefore, the actions of wicked hands are nonetheless uh, decreed in the plan of God. And this means, th uh, thirdly under this subheading, that God is in control of salvation. If God is in control of everything, then he is in control of salvation. God saves and not man. The source of salvation is God. 
if sinners are saved, it's because of what God has determined. In eternity, God chose a people in Christ. He determined uh, that a certain multitude, a fixed, definite multitude, which no man can number, would be saved, and that they would be saved by Jesus Christ. God did not choose to save fallen angels. He did not choose to save fallen angels. He chose to save fallen men. Hebrews 2.16, speaking of Christ, he took not on the nature of angels, but he took or took hold of the seed of Abraham. God chose to do that. He could have dealt with men as he dealt with fallen angels. And there would be no gospel and no salvation. The fallen angels are reserved in chains of darkness unto eternal fire. But God in his sovereign good pleasure saw fit to save sinful men and women. And God chose which men and women would be saved. So Ephesians 1, 3 to 5. Uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, being predestinated uh, to the adoption of sons according to the good pleasure of his will. Or in Romans 9 and verse 10. Romans 9 and verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved but Esau have I hated. This is telling us that without respect to any merit in Jacob or Esau, because they had not done good or evil, and the apostle evidently discounts the notion of foreseeing good or evil. He doesn't even take that into consideration. Uh, God chose Jacob and not Esau. And it goes on, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Why do some sinners believe and others do not? Because God, in his sovereignty from all eternity, has chosen and determined who will be saved. First Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 4. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. He's saying, you know you're of God's elect. How? How do they know? How does he know? For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. He says, this is how we know you are the elect of God, because when the word came to you, it came in the Holy Ghost and in power, in much assurance. And ye became followers of, of us and of the Lord, receiving the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. They became Christians and that was uh, that showed that they were the elect of God. 
because it is as, as the outworking of God's choice and predestination that sinners at the appointed time become Christians. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to sal salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. There you see it begins with God having chosen them from the beginning to salvation. The outworking of that was that in due time they were sanctified. That uh, is referring to the new birth, the beginning of uh, the work of uh, sanctification when the Holy Spirit renews the heart and the will and that resulted in belief of the truth. And it will culminate in the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called now it's not referring simply to the outward call of the gospel because those who rejected it heard the outward call of the gospel. But unto them which are called. It's talking about God's effectual call. God's effectively changing their hearts so that they were willing to believe the gospel. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Therefore, there in that passage, calling is traced back to God's choice. It's because they were chosen of God in eternity that they were called, not just outwardly, but effectively to when the gospel came to them. And uh, in Romans 8 and verse 29, we have further confirmation. For whom he did foreknow, in the sense of forelove, as Stephen Macaulay indicated the usage of the word, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. And so when the gospel is preached, the sovereign God of heaven who has determined from all eternity who shall be the heirs of salvation works by the power of his spirit effectually in the hearts of those whom he has chosen so that they are willing and able to embrace Christ as he is freely offered in the gospel. And so the book of Acts is not simply the Acts of the Apostles. It is the uh, Acts of the exalted Christ by the Spirit through the apostles. In Acts 1 and verse 1 we read, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. There's Luke, this is Luke uh, telling Theophilus that in his first volume, that's the Gospel of Luke, uh, he had given what Jesus began both to do and teach. Verse 2, Until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. And the book of Acts is the book about what Jesus continued to do and to teach from the right hand of God by the Spirit. And so in chapter 2, we read at the end of the chapter, the Lord added to the church uh, such as should be saved. When Paul preached at Pisidian Antioch in chapter 13, we read, As many as were ordained unto life, believed. And uh, in Acts 16, when the apostle preached uh, to the women 
uh, by the river uh, in Philippi, we read of Lydia, whose heart the Lord opened, so that she uh, attended to the things which were spoken by Paul. If you are a Christian, it is not due to any superiority in you, as opposed to others who heard the gospel as you did, and yet did not believe. It is not because of any natural superiority or uh, moral uh, goodness in you that caused you to respond to the gospel while they did not. It is to be traced to the sovereign grace of God in eternal election and effectual calling in time. God worked in your heart to make you want Christ who by nature you would never have wanted. And it is for this elect people that Christ died. Christ died for a distinct body of mankind, an elect, a chosen people. Matthew 1, 21, For his name shall be called Jesus, I shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Christ came to save his people, a definite body of people, from their sins. John 10 verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Christ tells the Jews around him, Ye are not of my sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. And they shall never perish. Romans 8, 32 to 34. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. That's telling us that Christ's death and resurrection and intercession make it absolutely certain that the elect of God, those chosen by God, will receive the blessing of justification from God himself. And if God justifies them, who can condemn them? But the point is that Christ's death and resurrection and intercession are said to secure the justification of the elect of God. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Isaiah 53, verse 8, For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And then in verse 11, He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. He intercedes for a definite body of people, a particular people. John 17, verse 9, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me out of the world. And then in verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for those who shall believe on me through their word. Christ's death will prove an absolute success. It will prove 100% successful, not because everyone will be saved, but because Christ didn't come to save everyone, but he did come to save a people, an elect multitude, and every single one of them will be saved. And not only will all the elect of God, by the renewing of the Holy Ghost, be brought to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they will be kept in the faith. Philippians 1.6 being persuaded that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. How do people become Christians? Because God begins a good work in them. He changes their hearts. He takes out the stony heart and he puts in the heart of flesh and they turn and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And having begun the work, he will perform it. He will complete it. Whom he justified, then he also glorified. Or uh, as Jude 24 puts it, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you 
faultless before the, his throne of glory with exceeding joy. So God not only causes his elect to become Christians, he causes them to stay Christians. They will persevere and they will ultimately be delivered from sin and all its effects in eternal glory. You say, well, we know all this. I hope you do. But what you must grasp is that this, this means that a Christian can have the certainty of heaven. A Christian can know that if he's in Christ now, he will be with Christ in glory, that he will not perish, that he will not apostatize and end up in hell. Arminianism, that is that false teaching which speaks, which teaches that man has an independent free will, a free will in the sense of a will independent and beyond the control and uh, beyond the power of God. That false teaching can no more give an assurance of heaven than Romanism. Arminianism cannot give anyone certainty of heaven. Because Arminianism attributes to man either all or part of the ability to believe. And if man is independent of God in conversion, or if he is partly independent of God in conversion, then he can reconvert back again. He can be a child of heaven one day and a child of wrath the next. It is only this biblical and reformed view of salvation that can give any sinner the grounds for assurance that he will get to heaven. But all of this teaches us that man is utterly dependent upon God. And that is fundamental to the reformed faith. That man as a creature, is utterly dependent on God. He is dependent on God for his existence. He is dependent on God for his continuance and preservation in this world. In him we live and move and have our being. In Daniel 5.23, Belshazzar is addressed and referred to the God in whose hand thy breath is. In Psalm 145, thou openest thine hand and we are fed. Man is a dependent creature. And man is utterly dependent on God in salvation. So the gospel message calls upon men and women as sinners to depend absolutely on God's appointed Savior, Jesus Christ. The gospel tell sinners that they must become utterly dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ if they are to be forgiven and accepted with God. This is the exact opposite of the delusion of Genesis 3-5 when Satan, uh, the serpent, said to the woman, Ye shall be as gods. What Satan was saying is, if you assert yourself independently of God's command, you will become independent of God. You'll become God. You'll become like God. You won't be dependent on God. And of course, every sin involves the belief of that lie. And uh, this delusion of grandeur has been perpetuated in the, uh, amongst men ever since. And so the gospel tells men that there must be a repentance of this delusion, of this pride, of this arrogance, of this wicked desire to be independent of God. And they must abandon that sinful belief of the lie and as poor, helpless sinners, they must depend upon God's salvation. 
They must be a saviour, God's appointed saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, that far from being as gods, they are so uh, helpless that they must come to Christ as dependent sinners seeking mercy in Jesus Christ. And that's why the gospel is summed up by the apostle as a message of repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's why repentance and faith always go together. Because faith is depending on Christ. And there can be no dependence on Christ without a turning from the grand delusion of independence of God. So the message calls upon proud sinners to depend on God's appointed Saviour. But then we may say also that man is dependent on God for the willingness to depend on Christ. So utter is man's helplessness and dependence that unless God changes his heart, he is not willing or able to depend on Christ. By nature he is dead in trespasses and in sins, Ephesians 2.1. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Men love darkness rather than light. And he is dependent upon the sovereign good pleasure of God to change his heart before he will be willing to depend on Christ. That's why the Lord Jesus told Nicodemus, ye must be born again. He wasn't telling Nicodemus something that Nicodemus had to do. He does tell him uh, that he must uh, believe on the Son. But when he says that he must be born again, he's not talking about something that Nicodemus must do. He's talking about something that only God can do. The new birth is God's work in the souls of his elect. And that's why he says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. We can't control the wind, we cannot control the Spirit of God. And yet without this sovereign work of the Holy Spirit, we are never willing to depend on Christ. So you see that man's dependence upon God in salvation is total. Man is utterly dependent upon God. And of course the Christian is dependent on God for his sanctification. Christ prays, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctification begins with the new birth that results in repentance and faith in Christ. And it is the continuing work of the Spirit uh, to cause the people of God uh, to become more and more holy until at death their souls are made perfect in holiness in the presence of Christ. Man is dependent on God uh, for the resurrection of the body, the, the consummation of salvation, when uh, this mortal shall put on immortality. You see, all of salvation is from God. Every part of it, every, uh, every element of salvation, deliverance from the bondage of sin, the guilt of sin, the power and presence of sin, the bodily effects of sin, the effects of sin upon the, upon the physical creation. These, these, this deliverance is all of God. So salvation is all of God and not man. Now, let us pause for a couple of points of application. Firstly, this truth distinguishes biblical Christianity from all false religion. This truth distinguishes biblical Christianity from all false religion. Atheism, of course, denies God and therefore denies the need of salvation. Modernistic liberalism or universalism denies that there is any need of salvation, that everyone's saved. Pagan religions in various ways attribute salvation to man 
by his own efforts. Romanism attributes salvation jointly to God and man. Uh, that the grace of God is mediated through uh, the ordinances of the church and received by man's uh, work of the right use of those ordinances. Arminianism does the same thing as Romanism. Arminianism says that on the cross Christ has done his part in securing a legal basis for acceptance with God but that men must independently of God or at least with only a general assistance from God they must exert independently of God their free will and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that man has some natural ability to move towards God. You see, the Arminian view of man as only partially depraved is the Roman Catholic doctrine. The Arminian view of man being only partially depraved is the Roman Catholic doctrine. And that's why, although Arminianism attributes more of salvation to God than Romanism, yet Arminianism has this in common with Roman Catholicism, that it attributes salvation jointly to God and man. The biblical and reformed doctrine alone ascribes all of salvation to God. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Boasting is excluded, because we cannot even say that we believed independently of God. It was God's sovereign good pleasure that he changed our hearts and made us willing to come to Christ who by nature we would have despised until we were lost forever. That no flesh should glory in his presence. For of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who is of God made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, let him that glory of glory in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 29-31. That's one point of application. The biblical gospel ascribes all of salvation to God. All false religion detracts from that. The second application is this. This truth is to be heartily embraced, not merely conceded. This truth is to be heartily embraced, not merely conceded. It will not do to say, Oh yes, I suppose it's true then. The doctrine of election and predestination and the sovereignty of God in salvation is to be eagerly embraced and gladly rejoiced in. It is an insult to God to treat this doctrine with a mere grudging admission. If that is your disposition, when you hear of election and predestination, if you say, well, I suppose then it must be right, but you wish it wasn't right, you have not rightly received this truth. Failure to see cause of gladness and rejoicing in this doctrine is sin. And this truth is not to be a mere appendage, a mere add-on to a broad evangelicalism. There are those who see this as simply a little extra. It's not. This doctrine ought to saturate and dominate our whole thinking. 
So we've seen that man, that God is in control and that man is always dependent. But then also we must see that man is always obliged to submit to God's authority. Man is always obliged to submit to God's authority. We've seen God's power, that everything is governed by God, uh, that the will of man is not independent of God. But God nevertheless has the absolute right to command his creatures, even though a creature can never act independently of the determinate purpose of God, God still has the absolute right to tell angels and men what to do. He has the right to command men to do what only he can enable them to do. His sovereign power does not remove his sovereign authority. Now Satan rebelled against God. Adam rebelled against God. But God has purposed to vindicate his absolute authority through his mediator king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45 and verse 21. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? And who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no God else beside me? A just God and a Saviour, there is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Just as God saves sinners and shows himself to be a just God and a saviour through Jehovah Jesus, so God will vindicate his lordship through Jehovah Jesus. And so Jehovah here says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. And in Philippians 2, the apostle takes up this prophecy and applies it to Christ, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the triune Jehovah displays his salvation in Christ and will vindicate his absolute authority in Christ. And he will... Uh, do so for all eternity. He vindicates his lordship in his gracious saving of sinners while they are in this world, bringing them into willing subjection to Christ through the gospel. Psalm 110 verse 3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. But at the last day he will fully and finally and eternally vindicate his own absolute authority by judging and being and bringing into utter subjection his enemies they will still hate him but they will be brought into an unwilling but utter subjection for he must reign till all his enemies till he has put all enemies under his feet 1 Corinthians 15:25 and so the word of God in this world tells men that they must submit to Christ now. That, they, that if they do not submit to Christ in the gospel now, that they will be brought to unwilling and eternal condemnation, but submission to an acknowledgement of his lordship in eternity. In hell... No one will deny that Jesus Christ is Lord. There will be no scope for the denial of that truth. And it is the obligation of all men so to submit to the Christ of God now. This means 
that it is the responsibility of every individual to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Acts 17.30 God commanded all men everywhere to repent. Romans 1.5 and 16.26 speak of, of the obedience of faith among the nations. All sinners hearing the gospel are duty bound to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Unbelief is sin. Christ speaks of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth convincing of sin because they believe not on me. In the book of Hebrews we read of an evil heart of unbelief so that God in his word as it is made known amongst men commands sinners to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only individuals but families are duty bound to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian man will say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He is duty bound to endure no wicked thing in his home. Psalm 101. He is duty bound to bring up his children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He must bring his household into submission to Christ so far as it lies within his uh, authority. Thirdly, the church is uh, to submit to Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is head over all things to the church. And therefore the church is to be in submission to Christ. The Lord Jesus told the apostles, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, uh, to uh, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. There is the church's remit. There is the remit of the office bearers of the church. The doctrine taught must be the doctrine of the word of God. The ordinance of, ordinances of worship engaged in must be those appointed in the word of God. God must be acknowledged as God at the outset of our worship. What he commands, what he appoints, and not what we like or what we think or what we want. So the church must be a place where the truth of God alone is taught, where the ordinances of worship appointed by God alone are practiced, where the form of church government appointed by Christ is practiced. You see, the church is not a man-made society. It's not like the music circle or the tennis club where people say, well, what will work? The church is to be governed by Christ through his appointed officers. So the form of church government must be Christ's. And the manner of church government must be Christ's. Admission and exclusion from the church are to be determined not by what uh, the eldership think will be wise, but what the Lord requires. It is to be governed by scripture, not expediency. We are not to say on the one hand, well we'd better do nothing about this matter that requires discipline because of the consequences. It's not our church, it's Christ's. On the other hand, we're not to say, well, I know that biblically this person should be admitted, but we'll be more cautious than the scriptures. So the church... In the church of Christ, Christ's truth must be taught. Christ's ordinances of worship alone practice. Christ's form of government must be implemented. Christ's manner of government and discipline must be put into effect. Christ's appointed methods of evangelism must be practiced. How do we decide how to evangelize? What is the limit of our responsibility? It is given in the word of God. No more, no less. We are to evangelize in the way that the Word of God tells us. We are to do what He appoints. We are to do it fully. But we're not to go beyond that. So we don't say, well, if people won't listen to the Gospel, we'll put on an entertaining show to get them to listen. Christ has not appointed that responsibility to us. 
We are to do what He requires. We are to bow the knee to Christ in our methods of evangelism. And that's why the reformed man will have a very different view of evangelism to the unreformed man. And even the very functions of the church. Who decides what the church is for? The Lord does in His Word. The church is His. He instituted it. All its lawful functions are those appointed by Him. The people of God may need to build meeting houses, but they don't need to build leisure centers. The church is the church. It has functions appointed by Christ. And his authority is absolute. So every individual is obliged to submit to Christ through the gospel. Every family is obliged to submit to Christ. Every church, every Christian congregation, meaning of the church of Christ on earth, is to submit to Christ. In doctrine, worship, government, discipline, evangelism, and the limits of its functions. And the state, nations, are to submit to Christ. Christ is the prince of the kings of the earth. Rulers are to submit to him. So in Psalm 2, rulers are particularly warned. Psalm 2 and uh, verse 10. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. They are to act as ministers of God, not just in the sense of providentially they do that, but by institution and obligation they are to do it. They are to bow the knee to Christ, not only as individuals, but in their public office. So that even civil rulers, kings, and governments must not act independently of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And to do so is king, is sin. Man is never to pretend independence of God. No man can ever pretend or endeavor to act independently of what God requires in his word without sin. So if we're just individuals, if we're heads of families, if we're office bearers in the church, if we're civil rulers uh, 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 and governors of nations, we must bow the knee to Christ. Because individuals, families, church, nations are duty bound to submit to King Jesus. And so civil rulers within their proper sphere must uphold the law of God, not an invention of men. So the whole of life, the whole of life is to be governed by the word of God. The moral law of God must govern all human activity, individually and corporately. So man is never outside the authority of God, just as he is never independent of the power of God in the performance of his duty. And that brings us to the third strand. This biblical view of God means that all history will lead to the eternal manifestation of his glory. This biblical view of God means that all history will lead to the eternal manifestation of his glory. When every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, when all his enemies are put under his feet, God will be all in all, the redeemed in heaven and the damned in hell will forever serve to display the glory of God in the fullness of all his attributes. To use a phrase of Christopher Love who was mentioned earlier on, 
God will display his glory forever in the fullness of all his attributes. And heaven and hell will declare forever the greatness and the glory of the living and true God. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory upon the vessels of mercy afore prepared unto glory. What hath not the potter power of the, over the clay to make of the same lump vessels to honor and vessels to dishonor? Romans 9.22 onwards. No one in existence uh, will in that day be able to call in question the sovereign rights of the living God. His enemies will still hate him forever. His servants will love him forever. But the Lord who has made all things for himself, even the wicked for the day of evil, Proverbs 16.4, will be glorified forever. Do we grasp that? Uh, that history is ordained of God so that the glory and the greatness of God will in the eternal state be magnificently displayed. God will glorify his great name and rightly so. So then, we have these three things that are fundamental to the Reformed faith. God's sovereign control, God's sovereign authority, and God's sovereign end in all things, which is his own glory. This sovereign God of absolute power and absolute authority disposes of all his creatures for his own glory, and every Christian should be able to say Amen to that. Here then is what is basic to the Reformed faith. Let me ask you, has this Reformed, this Biblical faith gripped your heart? Are you excited about this thing, this, this truth, this great God? Because if you're not then you might have the name of reform today, but you might be charismatic, Arminian, or anything else, or nothing at all, next year. Has this biblical and reformed faith, this view of God, has it thrilled you to think that God is like this? Or is it all just a bore? or even worse, obnoxious. In Revelation 4 and verse 11, we read at the end of it, we read of the elders falling down and saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Are you heartily convinced that this is both true and right? Not just true, but right. That God should create all things for his pleasure. It's not enough to say it's true. Do you say it's right that it's true? Because your heart has been changed by the Spirit of God and you love God and you desire God. God to be glorified forever. And then you can say in truth with the Lord's Prayer, Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Can you say that? That you love, you can heartily ascribe the kingdom, the power and the glory to God. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever.